Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so I think we should start uh, this uh, session. Uh, so many people is outside, so I will request if you are if you have friends outside, bring them bring them in. I'm seeing not that much of interest in network operations. The the next next one is a I think policy is running. So I think so many people went there to understand the policy. I think policy is boring. Uh, so for us as a network engineer, network operations is the main thing. Uh, so we have a pretty good, uh, interesting three presenters, uh, one from LinkedIn, one from Facebook, and another uh, So starting with the first presentation, I'll call upon Michael. He's from LinkedIn, and he's a very good presentation about, like, we face disaster all the time. Like, once in a time, if you are a network engineer, yes, you will, you will face this disaster once in your life, and that disaster will always you remember. So how LinkedIn... Uh, avoid this kind of disaster because they are a very big website and uh, I think all over the world they have a huge amount of users. Uh, so how they avoid the disasters? Uh, so I'll call Michael to present you, please. All right, good morning everyone. My name is uh, Michael Keogh and I'm going to talk about how LinkedIn traffic shifts between its POPs and its data centers to avoid disaster and improve uh, performance at scale. So today, um, firstly, I just want to touch on our problem statement about what are the problems we face and what we're trying to solve, and uh, particularly frame that in the context of APAC. Um, if any of you run any sort of uh, content networks um, or have content customers, um, APAC can be extremely challenging uh, area to serve uh, customers uh, due to the a large amount of uh, underwater cables that we use. Um, and you know, uh, there's a lot of emerging markets in APAC which uh, may not necessarily have the same sort of infrastructure that uh, European or North American users may have. So and then we'll uh, look at uh, how we uh, improve availability and performance for uh, members of uh, LinkedIn using data center, data center shifting, so moving users between our data centers, and also POP and CDN steering. And then um, I'm going to deep dive into two uh, particular challenges that we see in APAC um, and how we've sort of worked around them. And um, I also wanted to touch on IPv4 and IPv6, and then um, I'll take some questions. All right, so uh, who am I? Uh, I'm Michael Keir. I'm a staff site reliability engineer, commonly referred to SRE uh, at LinkedIn. And uh, I'm on a team at LinkedIn called uh, Production SRE. And what Production SRE does at LinkedIn is um, our charter is to help develop applications that improve uh, mean time to detect and mean time to resolve on site issues. Uh, build tools for uh, efficient site, uh, site issue troubleshooting, uh, issue detection, uh, and also uh, correlation. And then also uh, assist in restoring stability um, to the site during uh, critical issues. Uh, so traffic shifting is one large component um, of our team uh, charter. And uh, yes, I have a slightly funny accent. I'm actually from Australia, but I've uh, lived in the US uh, for three years. So uh, what is SRE? Who in the room is familiar with what SRE does? All right, no hands. All right. So um, SRE, or Site Reliability Engineering, is a term coined by Ben Trainor from Google, who basically started uh, Site Reliability Engineer a number of years ago. Um, it may be called, you might have heard of it under other things, such as DevOps, or AppOps, or uh, Production Engineering. And the skill set of a SRE is more or less made up of system administration, network engineer, uh, an architect, um, a, a really good troubleshooter, and also a software engineer. So it's a very multidisciplined um, skill set um, for, for SREs. And the role consists of generally architecture design, capacity planning, uh, application operations, which basically means keeping the site healthy and stable, and also, a large part of our work is also writing automation tooling to help make our uh, jobs easier. Uh, the SRE role does sort of differ between companies. Uh, at LinkedIn, uh, particularly, um, SREs are responsible for the DNS and CDN management, um, as well as our uh, traffic infrastructure. Apologies for that. 
All right, so quickly, um, just some terminology I'm going to use uh, during this presentation. Uh, so firstly, POP, or EDGE. Uh, this is where LinkedIn terminates its incoming requests. So this is when a user goes to LinkedIn.com. This is where your TCP uh, session is uh, terminated. A Fabric um, is a data center uh, with the full LinkedIn production stack deployed. Um, and a load test is a stress test uh, of a Fabric, uh, generally to simulate a disaster scenario or to actually push our infrastructure to find um, bugs and misconfigurations. All right, so our problem statement. Let's first start looking at uh, disaster recovery. Um, so uh, we may need to fail traffic between our data centers. Um, LinkedIn operates uh, four data centers across the world, three in the US, one in APAC. Um, and you know, we do have to occasionally um, move traffic between our data centers. This might be because our application stack may be degraded. We're actually trying to validate a disaster scenario or practice one. Um, it's actually a very good method to expose bugs and suboptimal sub configurations in our infrastructure. And also, if there is um, you know, noteworthy maintenance in a data center, we may move traffic out of it. And then we also fail traffic between pops. And this may do, uh, generally is to mitigate impact of a third party provider outage or maintenance. For example, uh, you know, a cable cut. Um, and uh, sometimes we also hit software or configuration bugs that ne necessitate moving traffic uh, out of a pop. The second statement, um, which is uh, just as important, sorry, um, is uh, performance. Uh, so for LinkedIn, site performance is extremely uh, important uh, to us. So we uh, sort of look at this from two ways. Firstly is within our data center. Um, so we assign each user um, to a data center. So we give them a primary and secondary assignment. Um, and we basically um, do this uh, to uh, get their requests served uh, closest to them as possible. And uh, we base this off member location, and also uh, we take into account the capacity uh, of a particular data center. Um, we also do POP and CDN steering. So we use GeoDNS to uh, steer users to the best POP, uh, or what we consider to be the best POP. Um, and we also use RUM uh, DNS to steer users to the best uh, CDNs. So for quickly, if anyone hasn't heard of RUM, it stands for Real User Monitoring. And basically, this is using um, JavaScript beacons to uh, get information about what the member is experiencing. So uh, DNS lookup times, connect times, page load times. And we can use that data to get really meaningful insights on how the site is performing um, for the actual end user. We have metrics on the server side, which only show a part of the picture. Real user monitoring gives us a full picture. Um, so <clears throat> let's uh, have a look at um, site speed in uh, a little bit more practical. So uh, this is three user data centers, uh, three data centers in the US. Um, and these are the average page, page load times um, measured by a third party provider. Um, and Basically, we've got a third-party provider uh, doing external monitoring for LinkedIn. And so we, when people connect to the US, it's a pretty uh, decent experience. Um, for uh, APAC, um, we only have one data center. And uh, when you sort of do the delta between APAC and the US, uh, you, get, uh, you get this, which is uh, a few seconds of extra latency for users connecting to uh, the APAC data center uh, over connecting to the average US data center. And uh, so it is super important for us to try and optimize uh, the performance of our site. Uh, and APAC is certainly uh, challenging for that. So uh, when we, uh, what does site speed mean to us? Um, so site speed affects user engagement. Um, and LinkedIn has done a lot of work uh, with data scientists to sort of quantify what the impact of site speed is on engagement. So uh, user engagement affects page views and transactions, which in turn basically uh, affects revenue for our company. So it is super important uh, to give a good experience in page load time. To help sort of picture this a little bit further, um, here's a graph that our data science has put together, basically looking at uh, the uh, proportion of page view increases versus uh, site uh, load time. So uh, you can actually see for countries like uh, Brazil, China, and India, the faster we are, um, the, we actually get um, a much better engagement from our users. 
Um, the U.S., uh, while uh, you know, we do serve the site faster in the U.S., uh, we don't necessarily see the same benefits for serving the, uh, the site fast. You may note that um, on this graph, we sort of normalized everything around two seconds. We've actually found that if you load a page in sort of faster than two seconds, um, you actually have a drop-off in engagement for uh, some weird reason. Uh, all right, so how does LinkedIn uh, architect its uh, traffic? Um, so this graph is sort of a very high-level overview of uh, how our traffic infrastructure is set up. Um, so firstly, we have the client at the top, and they use DNS uh, to find uh, our pop. Um, and what LinkedIn tries to do through its uh, DNS is give the best pop um, to the user, and we'll talk a little bit more about that um, a little bit later. And then within our uh, POP or EDGE, um, we have IPVS, uh, which stands for IP Virtual Server, which is a Linux kernel module which basically allows us to do um, IP, uh, sorry, uh, layer 4 load balancing. And uh, IP Virtual Server actually announces uh, Anycast and Unicast routes to our POP and basically terminates that TCP connection for us. Then we have um, Apache Traffic Server, or ATS, uh, which acts as our traffic proxy on the EDGE. Uh, so it terminates our SSL sessions uh, for us, and it then proxies the request to the correct data center. To the right of that, you can uh, see this uh, box called sticky routing. And uh, we'll deep dive into that in a second. But basically what sticky routing does is it tells the POP what data center to send the request to. Um, and then we have, um, again, Apache traffic server in our data center, uh, which acts as a proxy for all the front end application servers. So uh, let's talk about sticky routing. All right, so uh, sticky routing is a, a RESTful service uh, that we run in our data center, and it's backed by a, a Hadoop job. And what this Hadoop job does is takes uh, a huge amount of uh, data uh, from uh, basically what we call page view events and works out where our users are coming from um, in terms of location, and we um, basically compute a data set to say, for this particular user, their best data center is this place. And if that data center isn't available, this is the next best place for them to go to. And we store this data in a key value store um, built internally at LinkedIn called Espresso. And then Sticky Routing serves uh, this um, assignment data um, over a RESTful interface um, back to our, ped, uh, our uh, edge pops. All right. So, um, Coming back to solving our problems, so our solution. So for fabric shifting, sticky routing um, does a great job. It allows us to petition traffic um, between our data centers. Uh, sorry, allows us to petition traffic coming into our data centers. So we can split our traffic based on logged in traffic, logged out traffic. Uh, we can route our CDN traffic differently. We can route our monitoring traffic differently. Um, and if you're coming to a microsite, um, we can also uh, do something different with that if we so choose. So it gives us a lot of flexibility. And then for the logged in members, we basically shard um, all those members um, into our, what we call buckets. And then we can online or offline buckets to basically shape where our traffic goes to. Um, so, and so it gives us a lot of flexibility in um, moving our traffic between data centers. So what are the benefits? So we get to serve uh, the request as close to the user, user as possible. It also gives us a lot of flexibility in uh, capacity management. Um, you know, we can't necessarily control uh, where our um, users may be coming from, um, although we do a, a significant amount of research. Um, but we can um, sort of optimize as much as possible to make sure a data center doesn't run hot. And the other really cool thing is it enables a personal data routing. The cost to serve um, data can be extremely expensive, and if you're serving, um, if you're storing the same data in you know four plus data centers, and the user is only going to be ever using it from one or two, uh, there's a lot of capex involved in storing and operating uh, that infrastructure. Um, so we can actually optimize where we store our data um, according to you know where the member is going to access it from. <clears throat> So uh, we've actually spent a, a lot of time automating this um, over the past couple of years. So my team built this tool called um, Traffic Shift, which basically helps us automate um, what sticky routing does. Um, so we can automate failing out of data centers. 
Um, and it all, this tool also um, allows us to do automated stress tests of our data center, uh, which is something that my team spends a lot of time doing uh, to ensure that we do have disaster recovery capability. If you look closer, um, you'll notice that uh, pr this pr uh, prod LTX1 data center, which is our data center in Texas, actually has no traffic in it. And this is a screenshot um, from earlier in the month when we were doing maintenance uh, in that data center. So in t on our graphs, um, you can see the red line, um, or oh, it looks pink, pink red. Um, and that's online buckets for the Texas data center. And then we basically fail out of that data center um, while the maintenance is occurring. And uh, on the bottom of the graph, you can see as the traffic drops in the Texas data center, the amount of traffic going to our other two data centers increases. So we just redistribu redistribute the traffic. Um, in terms of uh, load testing, load testing is actually uh, something that takes uh, a significant amount of time. We do it multiple times a week. Um, so we've automated it. So we can basically say, what time we want to uh, stress test or load test our data center, um, say how much traffic we want to put into that data center, um, and then the automation goes and notifies people, executes, um, reports on it, and it also has a feedback loop uh, into our monitoring system. So if we do see a service running um, too hot, we can go and uh, you know, pull back and make sure that we don't affect the uh, member experience. So what does that look like on a graph? Um, so Funnily enough, the uh, two data centers basically have the same amount of traffic, which is that bottom purple line. Um, and then so what we've done is basically we offline traffic in one data center, and the traffic goes to the next one. And so this, traffic, uh, this particular load test, we're running about 50% of all our traffic in one data center. All right, so let's go and look at the edge. Um, so the... World map doesn't really show up too well on the screen, but basically we have uh, 13 pops around the world, and um, we've, uh, you can notice one red dot there, um, which is actually our Mumbai pop. And the screenshot was taken uh, earlier in the year from our Traffic Shift app, and we are actually failed out of our India pop um, due to uh, an issue um, with a third-party provider. So um, we use IPVS, um, which announces a unicast and anycast routes uh, to our data centers, and we actually split up um, our anycast traffic into regions. We don't generally run global anycast, because uh, we do see, in our particular instance, um, uh, less than optimal uh, performance for our users. So we actually split it up into APAC, uh, Europe, and North American anycast regions. And then we use GeoDNS to steer users to the, what we consider the best pop. Um, so for US and European users, um, basically everyone uses Anycast to reach a LinkedIn pop. For APAC, um, it's actually all uh, Unicast, um, which does have a management overhead, uh, unfortunately. But we've got something cool uh, to fix that, which I'll get to in a second. Um, so in terms of pop disaster recovery, you know, sometimes we have um, issues with providers or our own infrastructure. And so I've got two graphs here um, which illustrate that red dot before. So you can see the top graph, we've got traffic in the data center, then it drops off. And then you can see the bottom graph, uh, we've got another pop picking up uh, that traffic. Um, and so we just withdraw the uh, Anycast announcement or the, uh, for Anycast traffic um, using IPVS. Um, and then for, um, uh, for the Unicast traffic, we actually um, have a health check that our DNS providers use to see if we're up, um, and we just fail our health check, and they drain traffic, um, unicast traffic away from our pop. If you look at the top graph, you'll actually see a, t uh, like a slow tail off in traffic, uh, which is actually uh, DNS TTLs not being honored. So in terms of pop performance, um, LinkedIn currently uses GeoDNS uh, for routing or steering users to pops, but we're actually piloting RUM DNS, which instead of uh, you know, looking at um, the best, uh, looking at the best pop for a country or a state, uh, we actually look at the network that they're using. Um, so uh, we've got a really good example of uh, how beneficial that can be in a second. And then we also do CDN steering. So we have multiple DNS providers around the world and we mix CDNs to get the best performance that we possibly can. And we constantly evaluate that and adjust the weightings um, of the CDNs in a particular region. Um, so, 
this graph, the top two lines are basically two DNS providers in the US, and the 50th percentile uh, request time for all requests going to those CDNs. The bottom line is actually the net user experience for using the CDNs. Um, so if we, uh, for a particular network, if we use the best CDN for that particular network, we can drastically reduce um, the uh, time it takes to load assets from the CDN, uh, which is very much beneficial for our, um, uh, for our users. Um, so let's move on to APAC challenges. So again, looking at this fail out of the India pop due to fiber cuts. Um, so when we fail out, and sometimes it's an absolute necessity, it's out of our control, um, we'll fail out of a pop. And um, so in this case, um, Indian uh, people from the, uh, who are using the uh, pop in India are now using the pop in Singapore. So there is a, a jump in connection time. Um, note that is the 90th percentile, so uh, it's not an average uh, representation. Um, and then uh, secondly, um, going back to GeoDNS. Uh, so this is actually an example from the UAE. Um, so we have two providers, um, AS, uh, two networks, uh, 15802 and uh, 5384. Um, so for 15802, um, and I'm going to show the map, um, basically, uh, that uh, network doesn't have really good connectivity to our India pop, even though uh, GeoDNS says that they should go uh, to our India pop. Whereas um, AS5384, um, it's 45 milliseconds for them, which is fine. 220 milliseconds, um, that's not uh, okay. So what uh, RUM DNS does is it constantly evaluates uh, using beacons uh, what the best pop is for um, a particular network. So for whatever reason, um, uh, the uh, 15302, um, it does not have good connectivity to India for whatever reason, and that's more or less out of our control. But RUM DNS is sort of smarter than the, uh, smart. So it says, well, hey, I can connect to our London or our Dublin pops with 100 milli 130 milliseconds. Um, sorry, 160 milliseconds, or we can go to our Hong Kong pop, which is 100 milli 160 milliseconds. Um, so you could, you know, theoretically load balance. However, our ROM DNS is a little bit smarter. It knows from uh, London it takes 350 milliseconds to get to our Singapore data center, uh, which is actually like a really large amount of time. Um, if we go and use uh, our Hong Kong data center, um, the total is 195 milliseconds, which is actually a massive win for our site speed. So we actually took our RUM DNS pilot, put it into effect in the UAE, and you can see uh, that red line represents when we made the change from um, uh, GeoDNS to RUM DNS, and the time uh, to connect um, drops uh, significantly. So quickly, IPv4 versus IPv6. Um, so for LinkedIn, we generally see that IPv6 performs much better for our members, especially um, our mobile users. Um, carriers, mobile carriers in the US um, are rolling out IPv6 really fast, um, which is great for us, and LinkedIn's now a mobile-heavy company. Um, so we do see um, over 12% of our traffic to LinkedIn.com um, is IPv6. And when we launched, uh, you know, less than three years ago, it was only 3%. So we've seen significant growth uh, over the past couple of years um, for IPv6 traffic. So can, uh, in conclusion, um, what are our key takeaways? So application level traffic engineering is extremely uh, important for um, content providers, not just LinkedIn, um, but others as well. And RUM data is extremely useful for finding anomalies in performance um, and allowing us to uh, adjust, um, uh, make adjustments to give the best possible um, experience. Um, probably the biggest takeaway is uh, route traffic based on performance, not on just uh, location. This has made a huge impact in site speed performance for us, um, and that really is a win for uh, LinkedIn and also our members. And then finally, um, IPv6 performs better for LinkedIn uh, users. So that concludes my uh, presentation. Are there any questions? Anyone has a question for Michael? Seems 
Round of silence, I guess. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Uh, for your good presentation. And uh, so our next presentation is from Facebook. Uh, it's from uh, Srivastan Balla Subramanian. Uh, he's a very nice guy and a very interesting guy. Uh, he is from uh, India, uh, did his PhD in USA and now working in Hong Kong. Uh, so pretty mix of global culture. So uh, he's, uh, he will be, uh, so like say, to like give a prelude of his uh, presentation. So when we have a very small uh, amount of like chunk of traffic, then maybe life is easy. But when you have a traffic like Facebook or like Google, then you say it's a, it's a big mess for a, like a transmission engineer to uh, deal out that uh, backbone network. So uh, uh, Srivastan is a, from a uh, backbone network guy, and he will tell us how Facebook is dealing with this huge amount of traffic from his pop to pop. Srivastan, please. Hi. Thank you for the introduction, and very good morning to everybody. Hi. Okay, so today I'll be sharing with you some ideas on backbone network design and network resilience. Right? Subsequently, we'll be applying these ideas on the Facebook backbone network and we can quantify the cost savings. So first, let's look at the scale of Facebook. Right? Facebook is pretty global. Right? Um, in, in uh, uh, if you look at the Facebook backbone network, uh, it's gonna host a, a bunch of uh, social network platforms, right? So you have, on top, you have the Facebook Blue app that's going strong at 1.86 billion users. Then you have a host of other um, social networks like Instagram, WhatsApp, Messenger, each of them operating at, a few of them at least going at over 1 billion users. So on a daily basis, you have billions of messages, billions of photos, videos that are being exchanged on this social network, right? And you have these emerging bandwidth drivers like Facebook Live, and virtual reality. Right? So these are latency sensitive and they are bandwidth intensive. So if you look at the traffic that is there in the network, you can broadly look at it as two different types of traffic. Like one is a machine to user interface, and you have the machine to machine interface. Right? The machine to user is as Facebook adds more services, adds more users, there's going to be a steady growth in the uh, machine to user traffic. Right? And then you have the machine to machine where um, you know, all the machines in the, in the data center and the pops, they all come together, talk to each other, and gives you, delivers you the Facebook experience that you see on Facebook app, right? So that is pretty, uh, you know, it, it is growing at a pretty explosive rate, right? It more than doubles um, every year, right? So now, if you look at the, um, um, the, net, the traffic mix, it's actually a, a mix of the high priority latency sensitive uh, applications. And, and you have a low priority support services, right? Pretty soon we'll see how we can leverage this uh, mix of priorities uh, to make an efficient backbone uh, design. So here is the schematic of a Facebook backbone network. Now, it is, each blob that you see in this um, picture is, is either a pop or a data, uh, or a data center, right? They're all, um, the, we have about 100 plus IP sites, about 200 plus optical links, they all spread over like five different continents, right? So from technology point of view, in the IP layer, right, you have um, you know, IP MPLS capable um, uh, switches and routers um, that are optimized for backbone transport, right? From um, uh, optical point of view, uh, you have these um, CD rodents and digital rodents, right? And you have um, uh, flex grid and fixed grid uh, transponders as well. Right. So each of these uh, channels could be operating at, you know, modulations like QPSK, 16QAM, 8QAM, etc. Right. So it's a fairly uh, diverse network. If you look at the optical fibers, they're a mix of, um, you know, subsea fibers, sort of terrestrial fibers, and then aerial uh, fiber routes as well. Right. So it's a pretty diverse network. Um, you know, it's, it's got uh, 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 quite a volume of traffic running on it. So what we're going to be talking about in this presentation is how to design for this backbone. Right. So, but before that, let's first look at how traditionally a network is planned, right? So, a, a network typically, um, <clears throat> the, a traditional way of planning is we're given a physical topology 
and, of, uh, and a, a traffic projection, right? So a planner would typically look at the network, uh, you know, based on years of experience, based on, um, uh, you know, uh, what he's seen in the past in the network itself. So typically he decides some of the IP links that needs to go into the network. And once IP links are decided, he ran, uses a tool to run the, um, you know, the dimensioning of the IP links. He does some failure analysis, and then comes up with the uh, network design, right? So now the, the objective is opti optimizing L3 ports. However, what is missing in the whole piece is that, you know, um, you need a tool which can tell you what is the best design, right? Because it's typically manually done. There is no way to verify what is the best design. If there is a better design out there, how, how do we go about finding this design, right? So that is what is missing in this piece, right? And then there's a second, uh, the output from this layer phase is being input into the second phase, which is the optimizing the L0 cost, right? Where the routing of the optical circuits are done, the wave the assignment is done, and, and, and with the objective of optimizing L0 cost, right? So this two-phase two step approach basically is really you know, inefficient for Facebook scale network, right? So what we are kind of advocating is more of a multi-layer planning strategy where we will design the IP topology Right um, now, and do the L0 planning as well, all together in a single step. Right, so in a single step, basically we'll evaluate like you know we want a tool which can evaluate like millions of topologies, which can go through different uh, possible candidate solutions and let us know uh, what is the best solution uh, which has the best uh, you know uh, overall network cost. That's called the total cost of network ownership. Right, we want to be the, we want the single uh, in a single step we want to be able to design the IP topology. We want to route the IP links. We want to do failure analysis. We want to do uh, optical circuits routing as well as a wavelength assignment. It's it's a pretty uh, big task as well. Okay. So now another dimension to this whole network uh, planning is the network resilience aspects of it. So this net network resilience is done is, is available in different layers. In L3, you have loop-free alternates. MPLS offers FRR. Uh, OTN offers one plus one protection. Optical layer offers restoration, right? Each feature, each, each layer comes with its own set of merits and demerits, right? Like, if you have like FRR, which can do uh, protection um, at sub 50 milliseconds. So in the case of a failure, you can recover within sub 50 milliseconds, right? So you have one plus one protection, which can, done, which can be done at the optical layer itself, but the flip side is that it's a dedicated protection, it's not a shared protection. Right? You have this L0 restoration, which can, um, you know, which can give you, uh, which can efficiently reuse the resources across multiple failure scenarios. However, uh, if you see the restoration times, it could be pretty long, sometimes as long as even five minutes, depending on how long the, um, uh, the, the, the physical hops are in terms of for the, for the service routing. Right? So the question that we have is, given that each layer has supports some level of resilience, how do we, where do, which layer do we really use for doing protection, right? And is there, is there a way by which I can, you know, synergetically use uh, resilience available multiple layers to come up with a better network design, right? So we will try to answer that question in the next couple of slides, go through an example network. We will see uh, the cost of doing protection at different layers through these uh, next couple of slides, right? So we have an example three um, site network. On the left, you have the physical topology. On the right, you have the IP topology, right? Uh, the physical topology, you have uh, um, three IP sites, one optical site, and then you have three 100G services, uh, and uh, two of them are low priority, one is high priority. Also notice that each link here is assumed to be 1,000 kilometer. We'll work with these uh, scenario assumptions. Uh, the reach is 1,000 kilometers, which means if you want to go beyond that, you have to turn up regions or regeneration in the optical layer. So we'll design this network to recover from single fiber failures. We assume that IP port costs $1 and optical port costs $4. So first we're gonna look at the cost of uh, doing L3 protection, right? So you have three services, uh, all these three IP services, we're gonna look at the IP layer. Uh, we're gonna route them on the shortest path in the steady state. When a failure occurs on, site, on, on a link AB, we're gonna take the available shortest path along C. Right? We're going to do the same for the other failures as well, the failure BC, and then the failure AC. Right? So with this, we will dimension the network. We'll, you'll notice that a total of 600 gig is required, uh, capacity is required in the IP layer to be able to survive from single fiber failures. Now, if, let's look at the cost of this network. Right? So we, for each of these 
uh, 600 gig, you'll require IP ports and optical ports, right? So there are 12 IP ports and 12 optical ports, and based on the cost, which I mentioned earlier, of $1 for IP port, $4 for optical ports, we get a cost of $60 for this entire uh, L3 protection uh, um, design, right? So now let's go to the next uh, design, right? This is one plus one uh, protection, basically. Right? So since it's a, a optical protection, we're going to do the protection and we're going to look only at the physical topology. So um, in, this, in this scenario, so each, there is no protection at all in the IP layer. For each IP service, there's going to be a work path that is along the shortest path between the two sites. And there's going to be a protection path that is going to be a disjoint path. Right? Now, as you can notice, um, now there are these triangles that you see there. Uh, the, each link is about 1,000 kilometers, and if you want to go beyond 1,000 kilometers, we have to turn up regions, is what I mentioned earlier, right? So since our optical reach is 1,000 kilometers. So we, uh, we turn up regions at, at, at site C. Similarly, uh, we have these other services, uh, which also turn up region at site A, and this last service, which turns up region at site B, right? So now if you look at the cost of this network, right, this L0 protection, uh, the L1 one plus one protection, it's six IP, it requires six IP ports, requires 12 optical ports, and total cost of $78, um, right? So as you notice, the uh, cost of uh, one, one, one plus one protection is higher than uh, L3 protection, right? Which can be kind of expected as well because it's a dedicated protection technique. Now let's look at L0 restoration, right? Here again, there is no protection on the IP layer. So consider a service, IP service A to B, it's going to be routed on the shortest path in the, um, in the physical layer along AB. But when you route for the, for the, when there is a failure on link AB, it's going to be routed along site D. So why do we do that? Let's quick, uh, look at it, right? So when we do that routing along site D, we're going to turn up regions at site D, right? So when a failure happens on site BC, now that's going to be uh, routed along D as well. Now here, the regeneration ports that were originally turned up for AB can be reu reused for BC, because we know that AB and BC are not going to fail together, because we are looking only at single fiber failures, right? which means that we can reuse the region ports across these two scenarios. Right? We could do the same for AC as well, right? Re uh, reuse for AC as well. So if you now if you look at the final cost, right? so in uh, LZ or restoration, you do two things. Right? One is you reuse the IP ports and the optical ports in the, that you turned up for the steady state, at the endpoints, and also uh, the regeneration ports we have along the way that can be shared across failure scenarios, right? Because of this, if you look at the total number of ports that you require, it's only six IP ports, six optical ports, two region ports, and the total cost is 32, right? However, what you notice is that um, the quality of service that you get is not guaranteed in this, right? Because it's a L0 restoration, which means that you, know, you may not be able to get, um, you know, uh, uh, sub 50 millisecond rest, uh, protection at the time, and which means that you know, some of these services, like the high priority services, like the uh, red one that you see there, might not be happy with this, right? So even though it's a lowest cost uh, network, right? So, uh, but what, what we are uh, heading towards is a multi-layer design, right? A multi-layer design is basically where we see that the, the, the basic idea uh, value proposition is as follows, right? The L3 protection is giving you a very solid protection guarantee, right? So now uh, it's giving you the guarantee, but then it's giving you even for services which are, you know, support services which are of low priority, right? Now there is this L0 restoration which gives you a good, a good restoration uh, for low priority services, uh, but then it is not able to guarantee uh, timing, right? So what if we combine the two and say that for the high priority services, we do the protection in the IP layer, for the low priority services, you do the restoration in the optical layer. And that's what we're going to see here, right? So, the, so AB is a, a low priority service. We're going to do a restore in the optical layer just as before by turning up the region ports at site D. Now, for the second low priority uh, service, again, we're going to share the region ports at site D, right? For the third service, that's 100G from B to C, instead of doing um, um, you know, L0 restoration, because it's a high priority service, we do a higher level L3 protection, which means that you have a lab, you know, backup path in the um, IP that's set up, right? Now, if you look at the capacity requirements for this, you'll see that you, you need eight IP ports, eight optical ports, and two region ports, the total cost of 48 units. So as you can see, the MLR design that we propose here is the lowest cost design that still meets all the quality of service uh, requirements, right? So, so if you want to summarize, um, you know, 
the stuff that's been discussed so far, the traditional approach is um, planners always try to optimize for the L3 ports, and they do all the production on the L3 layer. But what we are heading towards is a, a, a multi-layer approach where we want to do a network TCO optimization. When we do all the optimization in a single step, right, we have the full visibility of all the cost components. We know the IP port cost, we know the optical port cost, we know the fiber cost. We can put them all together, we'll be able to get a much better optimized network because we have access to all the uh, component costs involved in one single step. And then you have the multi-layer resilience, right? So instead of giving uh, more um, you know, protection to a service, a uh, low priority service that's not required, and uh, instead of compromising on a service um, which requires high priority, so we do, uh, we do a, a, a balance in between where the high priority services are protected in the IP layer, and the low priority services we protect in the optical layer. So why is this multi-layer design really complex? Right? So you can decompose this problem into actually four different um, parts. Right? So the first one is the L3 optimal topology design problem. So given a traffic matrix, given a, um, um, uh, a physical topology, what is the optimal set of router terminations and router bypasses? Right? This is, uh, this is, in academic literature, this is well known to be an NP-hard problem. It's a virtual topology design problem. It's a difficult problem to solve. Right? And, then, uh, and then subsequently, when you do the, uh, you have this uh, L3 routing subproblem, right? So on the IP layer, um, you know, you can route on the shortest paths from A to B, or you could take any number of the longer paths. That's a traffic engineering, right? So that's again, a, what, what is the best path possible, right? That's, that's a combinatorial optimization problem again, right? Now in the optical layer, you have this op opti optimal express design problem. Right? So once you decide, here is the optical service, I'm going to go from site A to site Z, I can optically express at all sites along the way, or I could do regeneration at intermediate points to do some traffic grooming. Typically, this is helpful if there is a difference in the line rates between the optical rates and the IP rates. Right? Now, uh, then there is the L0 routing subproblem, which is, again, on the layer 0, when you're routing the services on the optical paths, now, you can still route them on the shortest path. I can, I can take any, any number of the longer paths, right? So which one is the right one to do, right? So if you see that all these four problems are kind of, you know, many of them are proven to be NP-hard problems. Uh, they're difficult to solve, come, difficult to put them all together and come up with a solution which can satisfy all these constraints, right? So, so if, if you look at these combinatorially difficult problems to solve, there are a bunch of ways to do it. There are like uh, mathematical programming, programming ways of doing it, and there are like, a class of meta heuristics which can be used for solving, right? And meta heuristics typically there are a bunch of uh, heuristics which are inspired by uh, nature, right? Processes in nature, like could be the uh, behavior of bee colonies, behavior of ant colonies, um, like genetic ev uh, evolution, things like that, right? So there are a bunch of meta heuristics available which can be used to solve these difficult problems, right? So when we're evaluating an algorithm, we look at typically three different things, right? First is the representation. So how how can you, how does the meta heuristic framework easily lend itself to the representation of this combinatorial problem, right? Second was the scale. Now, can this uh, network scale up, right? Can this uh, meta heuristic scale up to solve hundreds of sites, 200s of links, et cetera, right? And there's a convergence. If you look at the solution landscape, you will see a bunch of, um, you know, minimas and maximas, right? Now, uh, if, you, if I, want to, I want to have an algorithm which can, not get bogged down or which cannot get you know, localized to a local minima, it has to be able to go figure out um, the entire, the, the, the global minima that's possible in the solution, right? So looking at these, what we've done is we have chosen a genetic algorithm for solving this. Now we have collaborated with ARIA Networks. ARIA Networks is a network planning tools company. Uh, they have shown leadership in um, doing genetic algorithms. And we've used, their, um, uh, we've used their algorithms to be able to formulate this problem Right, the, the combinatorial problem, and, and have it scale to solve for the Facebook scale network. Right? So, that, that's, so what we're going to do is instead of going into the details, basically um, what we can do is uh, have a uh, look at the solutions that we generate, uh, that, that we have as a part of this, um, from this tool. Right? So uh, what the genetic algorithm does is typically it starts off with some samples, from diff, uh, which is kind of semi-random samples, and then it does, um, you know, some, it mimics some of the uh, genetic evol evolution processes, like crossover. Crossover is where you combine good solutions, good parts from two different solutions, and merge them to get better solutions. And there is mutations, where, you know, you introduce a, a radically new future, new feature into the solution, in order to see if you can get much better uh, solutions, right? So it's, 
So, th that, so based on these uh, island migration approach, that is one of the sophisticated techniques which uh, ARIA tool has used, we are going to be looking at the solutions that, um, you know, that we have uh, got for the Facebook network, right? So this particular top problem itself has been addressed in literature uh, in, by, by, by academics, by industry uh, in the past, right? So I, we went through about 50 plus uh, literature in IEEE journals and conferences uh, before we even uh, got into the details of this problem, right? So the, there is a reason why we think we are different from the rest of the approach is basically because uh, this network optimization which we are doing, it optimizes on the total cost of ownership of a network. Uh, it assumes the real ports, uh, real costs of the IP ports, optical ports, and the fibers, right? Um, now, this, this is a fully automated design tool that solves both the greenfield problem and the brownfield problem and explores beyond shortest paths. Right? So in, in, in L0, not in L3, but in L0. Right? So it scales to network in excess of 100 plus sites and 200 plus optical links. And it can do distributed resilience. Um, it can do things like you know, protect uh, higher priority traffic in the IP layer, low priority in the, uh, in, the, in, the low, in the optical layer. I can give you a solution based on that. A quick look at the modeling assumptions uh, which we use for the Facebook backbone case study. So the topology, um, you know, in, in the topology we use IGP metric uh, the IGP metric we use is the fiber distance. We use uh, fiber capacity of 9.6 tera. Optical reach is 2,500 kilometers. And fiber uh, operational cost is assumed um, while doing the, you know, the cost calculations, right? Since we have procured all the fibers, basically. Now, uh, from equipment point of view, uh, each uh, interface is operating at 100G interfaces. The utilization of any IP interface is like 80% and no more. Um, then we, we always assume the shortest path on the L3 layer, but we can take any number of you know, deviations in the L0 layer. So the tool will be able to come up with those suggestions of what is the path to take in the optical layer. Right? So we assume CD rotom architectures operating at 100G uh, optical interfaces, and we model the real equipment uh, costs. Right? From traffic, we assume 35 tera for year one. We do it for uh, three more years, two, three, and four, uh, assuming 50% growth year over year. Right? And, and, and we do 50% of the services we assume to be of low priority. The way we do it is we look at a service, we find out what is the availability requirement for this service. Right? And then if I were to use a L0 restoration, I'm going to have something like a five minute downtime every time a failure happens. So over a year's time period, we've tried to find out what is the downtime expected if I were to do only L0 restoration. Right? Now if the availability requirement can be done can be satisfied only by L0 restoration, we'll, we'll cal 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 categorize the service as L0 um, restoration capable service, right? If not, we say that this service has to be protected by L3, right? So that's how we kind of came up with this ca categorization, right? And then finally, the objective of our study is to be able to look at the uh, network and dimension it for single fiber failures, and then we optimize it for the network total cost of ownership. So in this, uh, in this slide, we look at what is the total cost of ownership saving you get by looking at an, a multi-layer design as opposed to a single layer design. That is, both the approaches assume only protection on the L3 layer. There is no split of the service protection here, right? But still, in, since in the multi-layer design, uh, you, know, you see that you, know, you have the full visibility of the network costs, which means that you can see that up to uh, consistently in all the years, we see about 30% or so uh, savings in the network cost only because you do a multi-layer design instead of a single layer design. Then in this slide, we look at the normalized network TCO, right? And on a Facebook network, if you protect all the services only using L3, what is the cost involved, right? That's what you see as the blue line, right? And, and, and if you, uh, if instead, uh, in the, the good thing there is you get uh, a solid protection, but you're giving protection to even low priority services, uh, which, which basically don't need that level of protection. And you have the red line, which corresponds to optical protection to all this uh, optical restoration to all the services in Facebook network. Now that is basically um, um, uh, it, so you will not be able to guarantee service quality of service for the high priority services. Right in between is the MLR design, which we kind of talked about, um, and, and that gives you uh, a savings, uh, a significant savings over the um, L3 protection, the conventional approach, uh, and, and yet still guarantee quality of service for all the um, you know for all the uh, services, right? So it, here is another slide which quantifies the TCO savings, the different cost component savings by adopting MLR approach as opposed to pure conventional L3 protection, right? Like what, what is clear here is that um, in year one, if you look at the green line, that's the TCO saving, 
um, you see about 10% or so savings in year one. In the subsequent years, you can see 25% uh, or more savings um, you know, in, in the network total cost of ownership. Right? That's a significant saving again in terms of you know, if you do the MLR kind of design. Right? So uh, if you look at the other thing to note is that if you look at the fiber savings, um, the fiber savings basically uh, is um, the fiber saving, you'll see that you'll have to put in some upfront cost in year one uh, in order to um, give the diversity required for the L0 restoration to give it savings. But once that is done, in the, in the next couple of years, you will be able to leverage this to be able to get the, um, you know, the, uh, the savings from the IP port and uh, optical ports, basically. Right? So and then we have the final slide, which talks about uh, the, M, the, the TCO normalized cost. If you do L3 protection, right? But then, if you if you didn't, if the if you uh, if you want to allow the the steady state paths to deviate from the shortest path, right? If if you uh, always take the shortest path, you get about hundred dollars. That's the cost you see on the left, right? So if you deviate by up to one hundred and ten percent from the shortest path, you can get up to seventy. Uh, you, the, the network would cost only seventy two dollars, uh, right? So about twenty eight percent savings by deviation of 110% in the steady state, right? So the tool pretty much is, has the capability to be able to figure out uh, what are the different possibilities and process solution based on the same. So in conclusion, so multi-layer design can achieve significant network savings, right, when compared with single-layer design by restoring uh, low-priority traffic in the optical layer and high-priority traffic in the IP layer, you could do significant network savings there as well. So in the, in the future extension, we are, we are planning to um, you know, uh, include the traffic engineering in a multi-layer perspective because as we mentioned, um, the RIA tool is capable, currently able to do um, beyond shortest paths in the optical layer. Right? We want to extend this up to beyond shortest paths in the IP layer as well. Right? So, and finally, the challenge is to be addressed by the optical vendors as well. So there should be an online engine for, uh, op for validating optical closures. We need open APIs for real-time path computation. And then we need optical port cost reduction as well. Right? So that's pretty much a summary of what we had. Can take some questions. Anybody has a question? Yeah, please. Sure. Um, this is Dion from Coriant. Interesting, sorry. I, I like your presentation. It reminds me of the days when I was uh, doing the design for Verizon, AT&T in the US. Um, questions on the uh, this, the saving that that you have got. Uh, are you applying the, the data onto how big is your network? For your for your analysis. Okay, for this. How network, many nodes and how many so links? Are we that, that's about? the hundred plus IP sites and two hundred mm. plus optical links. That's the entire Facebook backbone network, worldwide network. Okay. Yes. So do you also take the any cost reduction uh, into consideration? Meaning, as we know, the optical port is you know I'm, I work for optical transmission right. company, so it's, the price right. has been so getting decreased. Correct. So, so what we do in this case is we don't take the compression in the costs as you go over time. What we do is just the ratio modeling. Right? We, we, know, we know exactly what is the cost that's there in our network. Sure. We use the cost and for the next couple of years as well. Yeah. OK. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. So I'm just interested to know what kind of TWDM gear do you use to terminate the dark fiber between the pop and your data center? Uh, sorry, what is the? What kind of DWDM gear do you use to terminate the dark fiber? What kind of DWDM network we use? Yeah. DWDM gear, which vendor do you use? I mean, I'm sure you would be oh, using yeah, I mean, dark fiber. This is right? a completely multi-vendor environment, really, I would say. There are yeah. certain links, I mean, uh, depend on the, depending on the region, depending on the links, right? But we use different vendors, really. Yeah. Okay. So and yeah. sometimes they are uh, CD rodent based sometimes they are digital rodent based there's a, it's a, we have, and we have a mix of uh, long haul as well as metro. Since you, we're talking about 200 plus IP optical links, I mean, each one is different um, reach, different characteristics. So we use it's a multi-vendor environment, really. I would say. Yeah, the reason I was asking is like you have many number of sites, right? I, I'm sure you must be using some device which is very standard. Like we've been working on like uh, BTI and some other vendors. Like we see some kind of challenges with them. Yes. So I was interested to know which vendor does Facebook use mostly for majority of the sites. No, I, I would say it's it's more of we are working with the vendors to even improve the way okay. things can be used as well, right? So as I said, uh, being a global network like this, we have to work with multiple vendors. We yeah. cannot just be working yeah, with one vendor. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Any other question? 
I have a question. Yes. Uh, the thing is that in uh, the presentation you have said is a very good presentation, but the problem in like in South Asia, so you see there is a divide. Like it, most of the people we are working here with IP, and there is a divide in the IP people. Like there are network engineer, and there is a divide like there are transmission engineer, and the transmission engineer they don't want to understand IP, and the IP people they don't want to understand transmission. So, but your approach is totally combining the two things. Right. That is very good for a management pers perspective, because TCU is going down and down and down. So our our like investors will be very much happy. But how we will see that this you merging these two different set of people together? Uh, how you merge these things in Facebook? Yeah. So, I think <clears throat> I would say the way I see it is these are. Um, we can we look at it more from an algorithmic point of view, I would say, right? I mean, you have IP layer. So this, the, the study that we are talking about here is more of a backbone design study, right? So you do have IP components. You have the optical component as well, right? So yes, we need to, um, we need to I mean, I think definitely going forward, uh, having only the IP and the optical knowledge separately will not going to be, it's not going to be really scalable, right? You need to have a mix of both and if you do that, we should be able to uh, get a much better saving, is what I would say. And even like uh, like adding with you, like this, and always these two set of people, they like pointed to each other. You know, I didn't do anything; he, it's his job. And those guys, they pointed to each other. Like I didn't do anything. Correct. So, like uh, mixing those two Correct. people is uh, very hard for uh, for this kind of approach. So no, no, this, this is this is not an operational thing, right? So operational, we this is uh, our design, network design, right? So once the design is done, the Doing the design is where you mix the IP and the optical layer, right? Once the design is done, it's like as good as deploying a regular design, really. Because eventually, I'm going to have um, you know, IP link. See, eventually, you'll have an IP link. The IP link maps into a path in the optical layer, right? And on the path, you're going to have an optical service, right? That paradigm is not changing between this multi-layer paradigm and the regular paradigm, right? So there won't be any confusion at all in terms of operations point of view. The difficulty is actually the optimization, which we are completely taking care of from the tool point of view. Okay, so there, I, I don't expect to see any optical uh, or any uh, operational issues at all in this design. Okay, thank you. Anybody had a quick, any question? Thank you, Bala Sarimnes. So it's a very good presentation. Thank you. Appreciate Give your hands together. Uh, so, uh, so uh, 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 giving our next presentation, I should tell a story because I work in a company called Fiber at Home. We are a uh, kind of like a, um, we, we just give backbone to our, uh, to, to the operator. So we have a very small amount of uh, customers. Uh, the point is that we, I started uh, Fiber at Home after it begins uh, like a six months after it's, it's born. So it's like 10 years back. So when we started like uh, uh, digging up the fibers and we started buying on that time maybe STM4 equipment, then my management called me, yes, is the STM4 four equipment okay, fine, maybe we can go like three years or four years. Uh, I said, okay, I don't know. Like after two years, I, I ordered like STM16 equipment. Uh, then they asked the same question to me, how you justify, because two years back, you have installed all the STM4 equipments. I, to, I told him that, yes, still, I don't know. So after two years, then I, we, 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 we shifted to all with STM64s, and uh, we added all the 10Gs. Uh, to our routers. They call me again, what you're doing? Every two years you're investing and investing and investing. And also that there's two people like transmission and IP guys then are, they are growing big. <laughs> I told him that yes, I, I don't know. Two years back, we upgraded all our 10 Gs to 100 gigs. And now uh, I think if you saw my Facebook, I, I was really finding that which is the operator who has 400 gig uh, somebody told me, like, like I, somebody told me, yeah, I have 400 gig. Internally, they are just binding all the 100 gigs together, four, four into 100 gigs, and they made it 400 gig. So still, so the, 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 the interesting thing is that how we are going up and up and up. So last, like, in, in January, we had, a, we had a very good uh, management retreat. So the management people meet with the operation people. My MD called me. Hey, what you are doing? Now you have a hundred gig gigs of circuit, and you are again trying to invest. And I said yes. So what? Why? I just answered him. Still don't know. Yeah, there you see. You are you are going towards SDN. So that's the thing. So uh, yeah, hundred gig is two years back already. Uh, uh, so I don't know. 
beyond 100 gig, what is that? So uh, CCO Sun will come with this beyond 100 gig. What is going to beyond 100 gig? I don't know, 400 gig or 800 gig or terabyte interface. He will tell us from Arista. Thank you. Okay, thank you for a great introduction. And my name is, is Shishu Tsuchiya, Senior Systems Engineer of uh, Arista Network Japan. My presentation title is Beyond 100 Giga Ethernet. What will be happened in the Ethernet area within the one or two years? And this is the current data center topology. Uh, they, uh, we, in the leaf switch, uh, using one giga E or 10 giga E to the server side. And also they are using uh, 10 giga E and 40 giga E uh, as an uplink side. But east-west traffic is increasing by the machine-to-machine -machine traffic, as uh, Facebook mentioned. And the server performance will be more efficient by the CPU uh, performance and uh, uh, parallel processing will be an uh, uh, enhancement. So uh, this is Ethernet server shipment. Uh, there are all a group focusing 25 giga Ethernet port over 40 giga Ethernet in the 2017. Uh, green, green line is uh, 25 giga BPS and the purple line is 40 giga BPS. And it will be uh, reached 2.5 times than the 40 giga Ethernet by, the, uh, by next year. So why 25 giga Ethernet? Then the, uh, we have to the considering back to the 100 giga, current 100 giga Ethernet technology. Uh, 100 giga Ethernet was first defined uh, in the 2010, and they are uh, published uh, four times. And currently, uh, we are using 8.8 uh, 8 or 802.3 uh, BM and BJ were defined four lanes. Uh, so uh, currently, uh, 100 giga Ethernet using four lane times 25 giga BPS. So what is the rain and the clock rate? High-speed components are connected by the SADES technology. SADES means data to, the, to be transmitted and serialized and deserialized on the receive side. SADES technology's latest speed is 25 gigahertz. So uh, the number of SADES, uh, SADES connections are called rain. So uh, currently, uh, best uh, performance of the service technology is 25 giga Ethernet and 100 giga Ethernet are using uh, four lanes. And the more, more important thing is uh, PCI Express 3.0 and the network interface. PCI Express 3.0 uh, times four slot is widely shipment as a ship, uh, server platform. PCI Express 3.0 Physical bundle is, is uh, uh, 8 gigabps per lane. 25 gigabps would, could smoothly upgrade from 10 gigabps uh, server platform. And bandwidth efficiency is better than the 10, current 10 giga Ethernet, uh, uh, current 10 giga Ethernet uh, environment. And the migration is uh, very easy uh, to the 25 giga e uh, BPS from uh, 10 giga e BPS Ethernet. Uh, 25 giga Ethernet using uh, SFP28 optics, which can use the same uh, cabling infrastructure. Uh, OPEX serves the migration will be a minimum because uh, uh, the figure mentions uh, this is Migration is uh, very easy. Very same uh, cable inf uh, it, it can use the uh, same cable in infrastructure and uh, physical topology. 
and uh, bandwidth will be in increased 2.5 uh, times. And merchant silicon. Uh, we are using merchant silicon technology, and uh, when they are considering merchant silicon, uh, it, it important thing is how many lanes support and how much total bandwidth. Uh, first shipment of the merchant silicon, the Broadcom Trident Plus is uh, uh, only uh, 640 gigabps, and uh, number of services is only supported 6 through 4, but uh, current Tomahawk Broadcom chipset and Camium chipset uh, supporting uh, 3.2 terabps, and also uh, they are supporting number of services is 128. Uh, so uh, if uh, we are considering 25 giga Ethernet, then the, uh, we, uh, uh, we will use Tomahawk or Cabium XP80. And uh, this is standard technology uh, slide. Uh, 25 giga Ethernet is, uh, was uh, comp uh, first, in, first de defined on the 25 consortium. The draft was completed in the September 2050. And the uh, used technology is uh, 802.3BA and BJ. And after that, uh, IEEE will be, uh, IEEE was defined uh, as a standard. And 802.3B were was formed in November of 2050, and uh, 2060, uh, IEEE BY standards was approved. So there is uh, some difference, especially forwarding error detection, it, it calls fake. Uh, 25 consortium is uh, FC fake and RS fake as an option, but uh, IEEE 802.3B is using our detect FC fake and RS fake and no fake by the auto negotiation. We are currently uh, did this 7160, uh, which is using a Cabium chipset uh, supporting both technology and uh, Xshare. Xshare is a, a test generation vendor and the new birth module will support RS FEC from next uh, software release. So uh, I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to mention about this uh, sentence, uh, because if uh, we are considering deploy the 25 giga Ethernet, then the, uh, we have to care that this implementation of the RS FEC and uh, standardization. Uh, this is transceiver and cable information. I'd like to skip this slide. Uh, this is a key takeaway. Uh, 25 giga Ethernet is a cost-effective te technology because it can use same NIC from factor, use one lane with uh, 10 giga Ethernet. And it can use same cabling infra infrastructure. And uh, it can increase 20, uh, 2.5 times speed than the current 10 giga Ethernet. And 25% uh, resources compared with uh, 40 giga Ethernet. And one noted that there are two implementations, uh, IEEE and 25 giga consortium. We have to uh, care over the, this implementation. And the next is uplink side. Then the, uh, what is the best speed of spine and leaf uh, uplink, uh, other uplink? Of course, it is uh, 100 giga Ethernet. Uh, QSP 20 high is the most smallest and low power standard technology. And uh, industry shipment uh, QSFP25 interface in the uh, previous year, and CFP2 and CFP4 will be used in the long reach environment. Then the what is next? 
Industry target is 400 gigabps Ethernet. It will use SADIS technology by the 50 gigabps times N. The, it includes one times 400 gigabps and two times 200 gigabps and four times 100 gigabps and eight times 50 gigabps. IEEE 802.3BS, 200 gigabps and 400 gigabps Ethernet task force is targeting by the end of this year for the IEEE standard. Uh, this is an interface information of uh, IEEE uh, 802.3BS uh, task force. Then the, uh, which form factor will be used in the 400 gigabps? Uh, there is a candidate of uh, form factor, CFP8, QSFPDD, and OSFP. What is important things for next generation form factor? We never forget, don't repeat 100 giga Ethernet mistake. When the, uh, we are considering 100 gigabps uh, uh, 100 giga Ethernet, then we uh, first, uh, we uh, published the CFP as the first implementation, and but uh, but many vendor are using uh, CFP2 in the next generation 100 giga Ethernet switches, and but uh, Cisco is uh, published uh, CPAC. It is uh, uh, Cisco proprietary technology. And then we are ready to support QSP25. Uh, so uh, don't repeat 100 giga Ethernet mistake, uh, because if, uh, if uh, we, uh, if a vendor support a lot of form factor, then the uh, operator have to prepare the uh, various form factor. And uh, so uh, size is important. It should support at least 32 port per one U. CFP8 is too wide in this requirement. And the terminal capacity, uh, it requires 12 to the 50 watt to support, uh, to support 12.8 terabps, which means uh, 32 port times 400 gigabps. So, uh, industry considering OSFP MSA is important. OSFP MSA uh, uh, can support, can support uh, this terminal capacity and the size is small. Uh, this is the key takeaway this session. Uh, IEEE 802.3BS will be standard 400 giga Ethernet in the, uh, this year, and it will use current service technology with enhancement, speed enhancement. OSP, OSFP MSA is only one solution for factor to support high density, high density 400 giga Ethernet. This is the last slide of the, my presentation. Uh, key takeaway uh, this year, 2017, 25 giga Ethernet would increase at the server side, and IEEE will be finalized 400 giga Ethernet technology. And uh, next year, 2080, 400 giga Ethernet product would be expected in the uh, end of uh, 2080. Okay, uh, my presentation ended. Thank you for your attention. Anyone has a question? Uh, I have a question again. Okay. <laughs> Thing is that, uh, can you go back to a slide like uh, the CFP? Yes, uh, 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 no. Yeah. This one. So, like, the thing is that presently, if you find uh, the present equipment, I think Srivastan ha has agreed with me, we are all using for 100 gig CFP, right? It is, uh, we are all using, for 100 gig link, we are using CFP in majorly, 
in all the sites. So problem is that also is temperature for this area. Like South, South Asia, we are having a huge, huge amount of temperature. So CFP doesn't work in a very high temperature, more than like 60 or something, right? So what do you think, like whether we have invested in a wrong product for 100 gig using CFP? Or oh, there 400 giga is on it? No, 100 giga. Ah, uh, 100, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I, uh, industry uh, currently supporting uh, CFP2 to support a long reach, uh, long reach environment. And also, uh, also CFP4 will be support uh, long reach, I think. So the thing is that, let's say, uh, uh, yeah, so CFP, they, because it's using huge amount of power, 32 watts, so it generates inbuilt, it, it generates heat. But if you compare with 40 gig SFPs, so that is also already like that, that doesn't generate that much of heat. So we are not using 40 gig, we are coming to 100 gig. So is, is it a bad investment? My question was that. Okay, so okay, thank you, thank you, Sisyo san. Uh, right. So uh, if anybody doesn't have any question, we are like 13 minutes ahead of our, of our time. Anybody has any question of this session? Nope. So thank you everyone for joining our session. Uh, we'll be having our lunch and we will get back here on 2 p.m. Thank you. And thank you all the presenters. <laughs>